Morning, Journey. Morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Wonderful, wonderful. Good to see you here. We had a great crowd last night at our first worship gathering of 2015. It was wonderful and a good group here today. So we want to welcome you. And I want to say a special happy anniversary. And I know you join me in this. We want to say a happy anniversary to our Mount Dora campus, one year old today. How about that? Isn't that awesome? One year ago this weekend, we launched the Mount Dora campus out at Mount Dora High School, and they are celebrating their partying today. And I had an opportunity to be with them at one of our Christmas Eve services. I actually drove out there and spoke live, and it was wonderful. Great group of people, and we're just praying that this year will be a year that they'll build on uh, and, uh, and just launch them even into greater opportunities to reach more folks in uh, Lake County. And let me say this to you, congratulations to all of you because you now have 100% attendance at church this year. <laughs> so I just want to say congratulations on that. For some of you, this is as close as you're ever going to get right here. <laughs> this is it. So, you know, you might want to call your grandma and say, hey, Grandma, been to church every Sunday this year. <laughs> Just want you to know that. And she'll be so proud of you uh, for, for doing that. You know, here's an interesting fact for you. 40 to 50% of people make New Year's resolutions. That means about half of us make some kind of New Year's resolution. 50% of those resolutions are broken within the first week. 90% are broken six months into the year. I ran across some unusual New Year's uh, resolutions. Uh, maybe these appealed to me because of my quirky sense of humor, but, but some of these were just a little bit unusual. Here's, here's a New Year's resolution I haven't heard much about. Finish a chapstick. <laughs> have you, have you, has anybody ever done? I mean, really, think about that. Have you ever actually finished a chapstick? No, probably not, but that, that's a good resolution. Here's another one. Grow a plant. I don't know how that's going to, you know, what you're going to do in your life, but maybe helps the environment. I don't know, but grow a plant. That, I thought that was unusual. Here's a good one. Don't send a text to someone sitting in the same room or the next room. <laughs> you slackers. Here's a good one. Don't be persuaded by that 2 a.m. infomercial. Don't do it. Whatever they're selling at 2 in the morning, don't buy it. And here's one we could all say amen to. Okay, here it is. Walk wherever you're walking without staring at, using, or listening to your phone. Amen? amen. The world would probably be safer if people would get their heads up and look where they're walking. Today, on the first weekend of the new year, we start a new series of messages on making changes that last. Let me ask you a question. Why do we make resolutions, at least 50% of us do, why do we make resolutions every new year knowing that we won't keep them? Well, there's a reality that most of us recognize, and here's the reality. I need to change. Everybody say that with me right now. I need to change. But I'm going to give you a kind of a shocking statement to begin this important series of talks on change. And when I give this to you, some of you are going to be like, whoa, wait a minute. Well, why are we here then? Here we go. Are you ready for this? Here's another reality. I can't change. I can't change. Say that statement with me. I can't change. Now, before you mentally check out, before some of you push back on that statement, I just want to let that sink in for just a second. Because what I've learned is true and lasting change occurs only when we admit I can't change. Now, God is a God of change. In other words, God is in the life-changing business. He wants to change my life. He wants to change your life. Yet what's so interesting is the fact that throughout the Bible, God says about himself, I, the Lord, do not change. I saw a cartoon a few years ago uh, in a leadership journal, one of my favorite magazines, and you can see one pastor is talking to another on a park bench, and he says, my congregation is becoming more and more like Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So many of us do not change, and the point of what God wants to do in our life through the gospel is he wants us to change. And yet, God over and over in the scripture says about himself, I, the Lord, remain the same. Thou changest not, the famous hymn says. And yet, here is what's ironic. 
the God who does not change is the only real agent of change. Have you ever thought about that? God doesn't change because he doesn't need to. And yet he is the only real agent of change that provides us with the hope of making changes that last. And so when we open the lid of our lives and when we invite God in, here's what we realize. He changes us from the outside in and then from the inside out. He changes us from the outside in and then from the inside out. If I, if I look inside of me first to change, then I'm in trouble. If I look to the inside of who I am, I quickly realize I don't have the stuff to truly change all the junk that's in me. Yet if I look to God, I see the change occurred first on the outside of myself. You say, now, wait a minute, you're confusing me here. What are you talking about? Well, a scripture would be helpful about this point. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this. Let's read it out loud together. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is so important and fundamental when we talk about making changes that last. What that verse says is that God sent Jesus Christ to earth to do his work on Calvary. And what Jesus did is he did the ultimate exchange of human history. And what is that exchange? He took all of my sin and all of your sin on his shoulders and he nailed it to the cross. And then he offers us his righteousness and forgiveness, thereby providing us with the power to change. That took place outside of us, in spite of us, and is not dependent on us. True change takes place first on the outside, not the inside. Yet when we receive Jesus Christ through faith, by grace, he infiltrates our lives. He moves from the outside to the inside, and then we're changed from the inside out. And without that supernatural exchange that only grace makes possible, then here's what I'm doing. I'm just trying hard. I'm just striving in my flesh. I'm just tweaking. And I'm involved in superficial change. So what I want to talk to you about in this first session is supernatural change because here's what I want you to know. Superficial changes will never lead to supernatural results. Superficial changes will never lead to supernatural results. Our culture is addicted to superficial change. We make superficial changes all the time. We change our hair colors. We change outfits, we change houses, we change jobs, we change cars, we change churches. We make superficial changes continually, but superficial change is not the same as supernatural change, and superficial changes will never lead to supernatural results. So if I'm going to allow God to change me from the outside in and then the inside out, I have to say, God, I can't change. Only you can bring about supernatural lasting change. I submit my life to you, God. I'm tired of projecting this false self that appears to have it together. I don't have it together. You know I don't have it together. The people who really know me know I don't have it together. So, God, take my life, warts and all, tax, title, and license. God, I give it all to you. You, God, are the only agent of change that can bring about change from the outside in and then from the inside out. God wants to change your life, and he wants to change my life. And that, friends, I think is great news this first weekend of 2015. Perhaps you've heard me or someone else say this before, but I love the statement that said, God loves you and me just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. He loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. Well, you might be saying, okay, John, you're, you're talking about bringing about God, you're talking about bringing God on the inside of your life. You're talking about letting Jesus infiltrate your life. You're talking about opening up the lid of your life to Christ. But what exactly does that mean? What exactly are you talking about? Well, I don't know about you, but I have struggled to make changes in my life and to make them last. I have changed some things. I've changed some superficial things, and I found it was easy to go right back to what I was doing before. But some years ago at a retreat that I was on with some staff at the church I served in Ohio at the time, I heard a lesson that changed my thinking on making changes that will become the icon for this series of messages 
this year. I want you to look at the screen. And that's the icon. The icon is an iceberg. According to glaciologists, by the way, a glaciologist is someone who studies icebergs. <laughs> How many of you knew that? I bet you didn't know that. Dropped a little knowledge on you there. See that? I had to Google that last night. What is a person who studies icebergs? It's a glaciologist. According to a glaciologist, what percent of an iceberg typically is above the waterline? What percent? 10%. Ding, 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 ding. Correct answer. 10% is typically what is above the waterline of an iceberg, meaning most of the iceberg is hidden beneath the surface, meaning you can't see what's beneath the surface of the iceberg. So if this iceberg represents our lives, what is above the waterline in our lives? In other words, what is it that people see in our lives? And the answer is behaviors and actions. Everybody say that with me right now. Behaviors and actions. Behaviors or actions are what people focus on because they are what people see. So when we talk about making a change in our life, we usually concentrate on our behaviors. We say, I'm going to go on a diet. I will stop overspending. I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. and read the Bible and pray. I'm going to go to church every weekend. I will stop cussing. I will give more money away. Does this work? It normally lasts anywhere from a week to six months. Let me, let me say this to you. When we get strep throat with its rash, fever, sore throat, what, what, what do you do if you've ever had strep throat or someone in your family had that? Well, you can use ointment for itching and take a fever reducer for temp, and you can suck on lozenges for a scratchy throat, and they may make you feel better, but it doesn't actually make you better. To get at the root of the problem, you got to use something that goes deeper. You got to use an antibiotic. You can't just treat the symptoms. I ran across a disturbing and somewhat controversial study on purity pledges and virginity vows that was released in 2009. I got to tell you, this was bad news when I read this, but here was the bottom line. Kids who take a purity pledge are just as likely to become sexually active as kids who don't. Janet E. Rosenbaum of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health commented on the findings. And here's what she said. It seems that pledgers aren't really internalizing the pledge. Participating in a program doesn't appear to be motivating them to change their behavior. I don't know if this person's a Christian or not, but I found this wording interesting. Here's what she said. It seems like abstinence has to come from an individual conviction rather than participating in a program. Why is that? Behavior is merely the result, is merely the outward expression of the inward person. That's all behavior is. Be, our behaviors is merely the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot going on underneath the waterline that we don't see, but those things drive our behavior. So what's just underneath our behaviors? Emotions. Emotions are just underneath our behaviors and actions. Everybody say that with me right now. Emotions. Imagine you're driving and someone cuts you off abruptly and almost causes you to run off the road. What do you do? Yell, curse, cry, lay on the horn, grip the wheel, make a face. What caused you to do that? You feel scared. You feel fearful. You feel angry, you feel violated, you feel upset. Those emotions drive your behavior. Now, some emotions can be hidden, but often you can tell what a person is feeling even when they're trying to hide it. Emotions can be mixed because while you may be angry at the other driver for cutting you off, you can also feel guilty that you got so angry. Emotions are unstoppable because our feelings will come out sooner or later. Have you ever vowed to yourself, I'll never get angry like that again? How'd that work for you? Someone has said, if our feelings don't come out in our actions, they will come out in our ulcers right? They'll come out in our ulcers. What stimulates our emotions? We got to go a little deeper down the iceberg. Thoughts. Everybody say that word with me right now. Thoughts. Our thoughts are even more hidden. They're deeper underneath the surface. You may be able, 
You may be able to tell that your spouse is mad, but figuring out what they're mad about is much harder, right? You may, you may understand something's not right here, but you may not understand what they're thinking. A man asked his wife what she'd like for her birthday. She said, I'd love to be six again. On the morning of her birthday, he woke her up bright and early off to the amusement park they went. He got her on every ride in the park, including the death slide, the screaming loop, the wall of fear, everything there was. Five hours later, she staggered out of the theme park, her head reeling, her stomach upside down. He took her right to McDonald's. He ordered her a Big Mac, extra fries, a refreshing chocolate shake. Then off to a movie where they had hot dogs, popcorn, Cokes, and M&Ms. Finally, she wobbled home with her husband, collapsed into bed. He leaned over and lovingly said, so dear what was it like being six again she looked at him with one eye open she said you idiot I meant my dress size <laughs> and here's the moral of the story the moral of the story is if a woman speaks and a man is actually listening there's still a 99% chance he'll get it wrong <laughs> right Our thoughts cause feelings. Our thoughts stimulate our emotions. Now, I say most of the time that is true because some feelings can be caused by chemical imbalances, by hormonal changes, by fatigue. But the majority of our feelings are driven by our thoughts that we continually think. Well, let's go back to the iceberg again. What drives our thoughts? And down at the bottom of the iceberg, and that's why I call this message the bottom of the iceberg, are beliefs. Everybody say that word with me. Beliefs. Beliefs are what are at the bottom of the iceberg. However, there are different levels of beliefs. Level one is what we would call public statements. This is what I want other people to think I believe, even though I really may not believe them but I want you to think I believe him. After Jesus was born, we've just come through the Christmas season, we looked at this scripture. King Herod said to the Magi, go make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. That was a total spin job. That was actually not Herod's intent at all. Public figures in general, political figures specifically, are notorious for stating things for the purpose of creating an impression rather than communicating truth. See if you recognize these phrases. Read my lips, no new taxes. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Mission accomplished. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Comedian Stephen Colbert says these statements have what he likes to call a truthiness about them. They may not be true, but they sound true thus allowing the speaker to impress people with his or her sincerity. Level two are private convictions. This is a second level of beliefs, private convictions. As odd as this is going to sound to you, I may think I believe something, but it turns out my true convictions run another way when it's put to the test. Private convictions seem to be real at the time, but when circumstances shift, they are revealed to be hollow. A biblical example of this takes place the night before Jesus died. He predicted all the disciples were going to abandon him, all were going to desert him. And Peter said, with great conviction, Lord, even if all fall away, I will not. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Now, let me ask you, when Peter said those words, was he sincere at the moment? I think he was. Were those convictions true? Turns out they weren't. Did Peter feel the same way later that night when the heat was on, when he was actually confronted with the fact that he would have to suffer if he aligned himself with Jesus? No. You see, sometimes we think we have convictions, but they turn out to be fickle. They're as solid as jello. They don't run deep, and when circumstances change, we feel differently. So what is at the very bottom of the iceberg? Core convictions. These beliefs are are revealed by our daily actions, by what we actually do. This is what one writer has called our mental map. 
Every one of us has a mental map about the way we think things really are and how life really works. I believe if I touch fire, I will get burned. I believe coffee helps me wake up. I believe in gravity. Those are part of my mental map. I never have to remind myself, now, John, today, don't jump off any 10-story buildings. I never have to say, don't stick your hand in an open flame. Those things are part of my mental map, and my actions are always 100% of the time congruent with those core convictions. The core, these core convictions, the Bible has a term for those core convictions. It's what the Bible calls heart. Heart. Now, here's where we need to open up the Scriptures to understand how this all works out. If you brought your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. It's a lengthy passage we're going to look at, but it's also in your sermon notes as well. And I want you to see how this plays out. Mark chapter 7, verse 5. So the Pharisees, teachers of the law, asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? What's going on here? What are these guys worried about? A behavior. The disciples, Jesus' disciples, aren't washing their hands according to the tradition of the elders. What is a behavior? Tip of the iceberg stuff. I want you to listen to me carefully. Religion and religious people are always more concerned with outward appearances than with internal heart applications. Religion is always more concerned about outward appearance, tip of the iceberg, than core convictions. Mark chapter 7, verse 6, he replied, Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their what? Say the word. Hearts, Hearts are far from me. In other words, Jesus says their public statements reflect belief and devotion. However, in private, at their core, not so much. Now, jump down to verse 14, Mark chapter 7, verse 14. He says, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? I love it that Jesus asks questions like that because I want to ask questions like that all the time. <laughs> Are you so dense? Are you so dull? I love it. Jesus said, Are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his what? But into his stomach and then out of his body. So this is a biology lesson right here, okay? And in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. That's a whole nother talk. He went on. Listen, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men, say it again, right. hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, which is behavior, theft, behavior, murder, behavior, adultery, behavior, and thought, greed, emotion, malice, emotion, deceit, behavior, and thought, lewdness, behavior, envy, emotion, slander, behavior, arrogance, thought, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Now, here's what Jesus is saying here, and here's how this ties into the iceberg. Listen very carefully. False beliefs lead to inaccurate thinking, which leads to unhealthy emotions, which lead to destructive behaviors. Did you follow that? I want you to say this out loud with me. Let's say it together. False beliefs lead to inaccurate thinking, which leads to unhealthy emotions, which leads to destructive behaviors. True change, lasting change, comes about when we deal with the issues at the bottom of the iceberg, below the surface, below the behaviors, below the emotions, below the thoughts, and center in on the heart or our core convictions, our beliefs. Now, very quickly, I'm going to give you what I call the Ten Commandments of lasting change. And I'm going to say this. You need to write quickly 
There's a lot of blanks here, and I'm just going to write, read through them quickly. So maybe you need to copy off somebody else if you can't write them down quickly enough or go back and watch this sermon again online. But here's what I call the Ten Commandments of Lasting Change, all right? I'm going to read a statement, and to give you a little more time, you read it back to me after I read it to you, right? Six of you got that. <laughs> right? Good deal. Here we go. Number one. All behavior is based on a belief. All behavior is based on a belief. Wonderful. Number two, behind every sin is a lie that I'm believing. Behind every sin is a lie that I'm believing. Number three, change always starts in the mind. Change always starts in the mind. Number four, to help people change, we must change their beliefs first. Number five, to change what people believe, we must change what they care about. Number six, trying to change people's behavior without changing their beliefs is a waste of time. You're doing good. <laughs> Number seven, the Bible term for changing your mind is repentance. Number eight, we don't change people's minds. The applied word of God does. Number nine, changing the way I act is the fruit of repentance. And finally, to produce lasting life change, you must enlighten the mind, engage the emotion, and challenge the will. What happened on that? You started out so strong. You kind of waned on me there, number 10. Were you thinking that through? Were you thinking I'm challenging your will? I'm engaging your emotion? Very good. Now, I want to say something to you. That is all very important stuff. As you read through that list, I know you're thinking to yourself, wow, we need to talk about some of this. Absolutely we do. So here's what you need to do. You come back here next week. And you come back to the week after that because these 10 commandments of life change are fundamental and foundational to this whole series on Lord, change me. And we're going to unpack all these things that behind every sin is a lie I'm believing and that it's a waste of time to change behavior without changing someone's beliefs and that we have to, to change someone's beliefs, we have to change what they care about. This is so important. So you need to come back every week, and we'll unpack more and more in this series of Lord Change Me. Now, we're going to make a little bit of a hard right here and wrap up this session, and I want to draw your attention to one important verse in the Bible when it comes to change, when it comes to understanding authentic change, and it's from Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Let me read it to you. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them, finds mercy. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. There's two huge concepts revealed in that verse. Here's the first one. What we cover, God uncovers. What we cover, God uncovers. What we try to cover up, what we try to cover over, ultimately, God will uncover. And so many of us right now in this room, you're playing the cover-up game. You're projecting one thing, but in reality, you're another. I remember playing hide-and-seek with my girls when they were young. We loved to play hide-and-seek. And I would say this, okay, I'm going to count. You go hide. They didn't like to seek. They liked to hide. They wanted me to be the seeker. So I'd say, okay, you go hide, and I'm going to count. And often what they would do when they were little is they'd go into their rooms, and they'd get in their beds, and they'd take their cover, <laughs> and they'd put it over their head like this. Okay, Daddy, I'm ready. <laughs> you see, they couldn't see me. And they thought I couldn't see them. I could see them. 
like you're seeing me right now. What else? I look ridiculous. <laughs> they looked adorable, but ridiculous nonetheless. That's how ridiculous you and I look when we try to cover our stuff from God. When we say, God doesn't see. He doesn't know what's going on. Huh? Only we're not as adorable. Whenever we try to cover our sin, whenever we try to cover our stuff from God, Here's what we do. First of all, we tend to blame others. I'm the way I am because of my family. My parents messed me up. My mother was mean-spirited. My father was passive and distant. Now, uh, families of origin have a huge imprint on us. Part of what we're going to talk about in this series is the dysfunction that all of us come from in our families of origin. It's a huge impact on all of our lives. But so often we get stuck in a pattern of blame and we just want to live in blame and we don't want to take responsibility for our life. And so often we blame our parents and when we get married, we start to transfer that blame to our spouse. Well, it's because of my spouse. And we play the blame game. It's as old as Adam and Eve. Eve said, the snake, he tricked me. Adam said, the woman, the woman you put here, by the way, I didn't ask for her. <laughs> See, shame, shame leads to blame. And blame leads to a life that is lame. And then something else happens when we try to cover ourselves. You know what we try to do when we try to cover ourselves? We invite others to come under the blanket with us. Come on, nobody's going to know. Come on, nobody's going to. God's not going to find out. He doesn't see. He doesn't care. You know what I call those people that we invite, invite under the blanket with us? I call them sinful sympathizers. These are people who are covering up stuff in their own lives and they sympathize with our sin and they'd say, I'd sleep around on your spouse too if she acted like that. <laughs> if he did that to me. If my job was as stressful as yours, I'd be drinking every day and smoking weed too. You know, you got to do what you got to do to get by. You know what I'm saying? Those are sinful sympathizers and every bar and club in Central Florida is filled with them. So here's what we got to come to terms with, friends. What we cover, God ultimately will uncover. Have you ever noticed that? I have dealt with so many situations, so many people in my life, and they've played the cover-up game. And they've projected one thing, but in reality, they were another. And I have known intuitively or instinctively something was off, but I couldn't quite figure it out, couldn't put my finger on it. But after a while, the truth always comes out, always. Now, I've learned truth comes out a little at a time, just like the country song, right? But it does come out. The Scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. And when the big reveal happens, it's not pretty. So the first part of Proverbs 28 says, what we cover, God will uncover. Yet look at the last part. The last part, verse 13, says this, what we uncover, God covers. Isn't that sweet? What we uncover, God covers. You say, what are you talking about? Look at what he says. But whoever confesses, what does the word confess mean? The word confession, biblically speaking, doesn't mean I just spill my guts or I blab all my sins. It means I agree with, I align myself with. When I'm confessing my sins, my shortcomings, my fatal and futile attempts at changing myself, I'm just laying out the truth before God. When I confess my sins to God, I've never known God to say, oh, John, I didn't know that. I didn't know you committed that moral turnover. I didn't know you had those bad thoughts. I didn't know you said those hurtful words. I did. We're never going to surprise God when we confess. Well, what's the key to change? It's inviting God, the ultimate change agent, into our lives. It's uncovering our junk. It's confessing our sins. It's agreeing with God about our messed up, broken condition. But the scriptures go on. But whoever confesses and renounces, the word renounce means left behind. That's another word for repentance. So first we confess, we agree with God, but we don't stop there. We make an about face. We turn and walk the other way. We change our mind. We renounce. We repent. And if we confess and repent, if we confess and renounce, check out what happens. Proverbs 28, 13. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And we know from the other side of the cross... 
These words were written in the Old Testament. We know on the other side of the cross now. All of our sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So when we uncover our stuff, confession and repentance triggers the mercy of God and our sin and our junk is covered by the blood of Jesus. Isn't that sweet? That's a good deal. When we're playing the cover-up game, what do we do? We blame. We hook up with sinful sympathizers. We lie to God. We lie to ourselves. We lie to those who love us. Yet when we confess and repent, we uncover, and what happens? We don't blame anymore because we realize nobody else is responsible for my life. Nobody else is responsible for my happiness. I take ownership. I say I blew it. I messed up. I've fallen short, and I need help. Then we find ourselves spurred on by this holy change agent moving us towards and gathering around and hanging out, not with sinful sympathizers, but what I like to call encouraging empathizers. Where do you find encouraging empathizers? In the community of believers. You find yourself moving toward and getting near people who have the same values as you do. You want to move toward marriages who have a holy view of marriage, not a Hollywood view, who are loving each other, who are reconciling, who are forgiving, who are making their marriage a priority. And you find yourself being drawn to people who challenge you, who hold you accountable, who pray for you, who share with you. That's not going to happen with sinful sympathizers. Friends, it is amazing how quickly people run away from you when they're covering stuff and you decide to come clean. Jesus said, you're going to know the truth and the truth will set you free. And you'll probably lose some friends along the way too. When you're being honest with God and with others around you, there's nothing like that. When you're agreeing with God's truth and you're telling the truth about your whole deal, you're being honest with others and you're saying, here I am, God. I just want to uncover and let the blood of Jesus cover me. I believe the church, when it's working right, is the perfect place for imperfect people. That's why we say everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And through Jesus, anything is possible. Friends, I'm not perfect. I know that's a shock to you, right? You knew that already, right? And you're not perfect either. And so often, here's what the devil will do. He'll say, don't share your secrets with others. Don't share what you're dealing with with those encouraging empathizers because they're going to laugh at you. They're going to trash you. They're going to say, I can't believe you're dealing with that. That's a lie. And sometimes we have to call the devil what he is. He's a liar and the father of lies. And whenever I have struggled with, whenever I've shared something with my encouraging empathizers, whenever I share secrets or dark stuff that I think, oh man, they would freak out if they knew I was dealing with that because I'm a pastor. Whenever I've done that, you know what? I get encouragement. I get support. I get prayers. I get help. I don't get bashed. I get blessed. So what we cover up, God will uncover it one day. And you don't want to go there. You want to go ahead and uncover, and what you uncover, God will cover over with his forgiveness and grace and mercy. And by the way, that's why it's so important for you to get into some kind of community group, some kind of growth group, some kind of home group. I want to encourage you to do that, particularly with this new series. This new series lends itself. There's some great material that every week the groups are going to be going through and they're going to be unpacking what it means to be emotionally healthy and spiritually mature, how those two things are integrated, intertwined. You can't undo that. And we're going to talk about how to make lasting change. This is discipleship at its core. And if you're not in a group, you're just going to miss out on something. So go to the Connection Center and check with uh, someone out there and say, I'd like to know how to get into a group because Starting next weekend, every week after that, we're going to be talking in our groups about these very important materials. Now, let me just wrap up by telling you this uh, final story that's helped me understand this whole cover, uncover thing a little bit better. A little boy named Johnny and his big sister Sally went to stay a few days in the summer with their grandparents. And when Johnny arrived, Grandpa gave him his first slingshot. Johnny loved it. He always wanted a slingshot, but he wasn't very good with it. He practiced in the woods. He could never hit his target he was trying for. So as he came back to the house, he was in the backyard of his grandparents' house, and he spied his grandmother's pet duck. And on impulse, he just picked up a rock, put it in a slingshot, and he let it fly. And guess what? The stone hit the duck in the head, and the duck fell over dead. The boy panicked. He didn't know what to do. Desperately, he picked up the duck, and he hid the duck in a wood pile. 
He thought everything was covered up. And then he looked up and he saw his big sister, Sally, watching. Sally had seen it all. And she didn't say a word, at least not at the time. After lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's watch, wash the dishes. Can you help me? Sally said, you know, Johnny told me he wanted to help you in the kitchen today, Grandma, didn't you, Johnny? <laughs> then she leaned over and she said, remember the duck. <laughs> so Johnny did dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if the children would want to go fishing with him. Grandma said, I'm sorry, Grandpa. I need Sally here to help me make supper tonight. Sally smiled and said, that's all taken care of, Grandma. Johnny wants to do it. And again, she whispered, remember the duck. <laughs> and Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's chores, finally, he couldn't stand it any longer. And he went to Grandma and said, Grandma, I've got something terrible I have to tell you. I killed your favorite duck. I didn't mean to do it. I just did it accidentally with my slingshot, the first thing I've ever hit. I'm sorry. And Grandma said to him, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the kitchen window, and I watched the whole thing. And I want you to know that I love you, and I forgave you immediately. But here's what I wondered, Johnny. I wondered how long you would be Sally's slave. How long will you be Sally's slave? You got a choice to make this new year. The choice is this. You can go through this new year like you've gone through other new years. You can just cover up and think that nobody sees, nobody knows, or you can uncover. And you say, God, Lord, change me. Next week, we're going to begin to root out some false beliefs that lead to inaccurate thinking, which leads to unhealthy emotions, which leads to destructive behaviors. But today, we're going to end how we began. Let's all stand together. Would you stand with me right now? I want you to say out loud with me this statement that we said at the beginning because there's going to be something good and important that comes after it. So say this out loud with me one more time. Say it with me. I can't change. Say it with me. But here's what I want you to say. God can change me. Let's say the word but first because that's important. But God can change me. Say it one more time. But God can change me. Psalm 53, 6 from the Message Bible says God turns life around. That is our hope. Our hope is Christ in us who is the hope of glory. And I want to ask, have you received that? Are you walking in that? Would you bow your heads and let me close us in prayer. God, I thank you for your grace and mercy in my life. And I know if it were not for you, I would not even be aware of you or my need for your transforming work deep beneath the surface of my life. Lord, give me the courage to be honest and to allow your Holy Spirit's power to invade all of who I am deep below the surface of my iceberg so that Jesus might be formed in me. Lord, change me. Lord, help me to grasp how wide and long and high and deep the love of Jesus is for me personally. In Jesus' name, we pray. And we all agreed and said, amen. amen.